It's going to be a quick rundown of everything you need to know for chapter one for the exam. You need to know the characteristics of living things. That includes the organization, responsiveness, growth and differentiation, reproduction, movement, and metabolism. Make sure that you can list those and make sure that you can give a definition of those. Make sure that you know the difference between anatomy and physiology. Anatomy is structure and physiology is function. Make sure that you understand the levels of organization from the simplest level down to the most complex level. The chemical level is the simplest, the organism level is the most complex. At the chemical level it starts out with atoms and atom is the uh, simplest stable unit of matter. The organism is the most complex uh, level that we have. Um, also you should know that the cells at the cellular level are the smallest living unit. Know the different organ systems, the integumentary system, skeletal, muscular, nervous, endocrine, cardiovascular, and on. You should know some of the organs in each one of these systems. There's also the lymphatic, respiratory, digestive, urinary, and male, product, male reproductive and female reproductive systems. Homeostasis, make sure you understand the scientific definition, which is the existence of a stable internal environment. Autoregulation is intrinsic, that means it happens automatically, like blood vessels dilating. Extrinsic regulation is not automatic. It requires the nervous system or the endocrine system to give a command in order for the homeostatic regulation to occur. In order for homeostatic regulation to occur, whether it's autoregulation or extrinsic regulation, there are three things used in the system. A receptor, that's the thing that's sensitive to the change, whatever the change might be. A control center, like the brain that's going to interpret the change, and an effector where that control center will send out a command and the effector will then create a response. There's two different types of homeostatic regulation. There's negative feedback and there's positive feedback. In negative feedback, the response opposes the original system. In negative feedback, the response opposes the original stimulus. Most systems in the body use negative feedback to control several different things, like body temperature, body fluid composition, body fluid volume, and waste product concentration. Positive feedback, on the other hand, is more rare in the body, and it, and it is a response that reinforces the original stimulus. Two different things, like blood clotting and childbirth, like we talked about in class, are examples of positive feedback. One example of negative feedback in the body is the control of body temperature. We talked about how normal body temperature is when the body's at homeostasis. If the temperature rises, there's receptors in the skin and in the hypothalamus that detect that change, sends the information to the control center, which is the brain. The brain then will send a command to the effectors. The effectors in this case are sweat glands and blood vessels. Those two effectors will cause the temperature to decrease as a, in the response and to go back down to the normal body temperature, and then the normal temperature is restored. Here's positive feedback of blood clotting. There's a cut in the blood vessel. It releases chemicals. A blood clot forms. The forming blood clot sends out more chemicals. Those chemicals are going to cause an even bigger blood clot until we finally get a big enough blood clot that's going to stop the bleeding. That's positive feedback. Another example, again, is labor and delivery. Make sure you know the anatomical landmarks like frontal, cephalic, cranial, facial, nasal, ocular, otic, buccal, cervical, oral, and mental. That's in the head area. In the upper body area, it's the thoracic, mammary, abdominal, umbilical, pelvic, inguinal, pubic, lumbar, and gluteal. In the upper extremity, it's acromial, axillary, brachial, antecubital, olecranal, antebrachial, carpal, palmar, pollux, phalanges, and manual. And in the lower extremity, there's femoral, patellar, crural, tarsal, phalanges, pedal, sural, calcaneal, and plantar. And note these are adjectives and not the nouns. Here's a picture. Make sure that you can identify both the scientific terminology as well as the layman's term because that's how the question will be asked. For example, where is the frontal area, A, B, C, or D? You would want to say it is the forehead. The otic area is the ear. The umbilical area is the navel area. In the lower extremity, you have the crural or the tarsal or the digits. Make sure that you know all of those different terminologies. There's different terminologies on the back of the body that are different from the anterior portion of the body. Make sure you know the anatomical direction. Superior is up, inferior is down. There's anterior and posterior, ventral, dorsal, right, left, medial, lateral, proximal, distal. Make sure you know the definitions of all of those. Also know directions like 
This is an example of the directions. Cranial is towards the head, caudal is towards the tail, anterior is towards the front, posterior is towards the back, proximal is towards the shoulder, distal is towards the fingertips, or proximal is towards the hip, distal is towards the toes, medial is towards the midline of the body, lateral is away from the midline of the body. Make sure you know the superficial anatomy like the abdominal pelvic quadrants, the upper and lower right quadrant, the upper and lower left quadrant. Make sure you know some of the organs that are in those. In the right upper quadrant there's the liver and the gallbladder. In the right lower quadrant there's the appendix. The anatomists use abdominal pelvic regions rather than quadrants. Make sure you know all of these. Right and left hypochondriac, epigastric, right and left lumbar, umbilical, right and left inguinal, and hypogastric. There are planes also in the body. There's the transverse plane, the frontal plane, and the sagittal plane. When you're talking about a cut or a slice through an organ, then it would be called a transverse section or a cross section. Here's a picture. It shows the transverse plane divides the body into a superior and inferior portion. The sagittal plane divides the body into a right and a left. If it's right down the middle, it's called a mid-sagittal plane, equally dividing the right and the left. If it's off to the side, uh, but still dividing the body into a right and a left, it's called the parasagittal plane. The frontal plane divides the body, divides the body into a right and a left side. Know the body cavities. There's the dorsal body cavity and there's the ventral body cavity. The dorsal body cavity contains cavities that house the brain and the spinal cord. The cranial cavity houses the brain. The vertebral uh, cavity houses the spinal cord. In the ventral body cavities, there's the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. The diaphragm is a muscle that divides uh, and separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. In the thoracic cavity, you have the pleural cavities, which contain the lungs. So there's the right and the left pleural cavity. And in between those two pleural cavities is a space called the mediastinum. And at the inferior aspect of that mediastinum is the pericardial cavity, which contains the heart. Below the diaphragm, then, is the abdominal pelvic cavity that contains the peritoneal cavity, which houses the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. Here's a picture of all the cavities. You can see the pleural cavity. It's a lateral view, so you only see one pleural cavity. You see the pericardial cavity. The diaphragm is right below that, and below that we have the abdominal pelvic cavity that contains the peritoneal cavity. That peritoneal cavity then has the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity within it. There are three serous membranes that line these organs and line the cavities of the ventral. There are three. There are three serous membranes of the ventral cavities. There's the pleura, the pericardium, and the peritoneum. The pleura houses the lungs and lines the pleural cavities. The visceral pleura is adhered to the lungs. The parietal pleura lines the pleural cavity. The pericardium is found in the heart. The pericardium surrounds the heart. The visceral pericardium is adhered closely to the heart. The parietal peri pericardium lines the pericardial cavity. The peritoneum lines the peritoneal cavity. The visceral peritoneum is adhered to the organs of the peritoneal cavity and the parietal peritoneum lines the peritoneal cavity. Here's a picture. You can see the right and the left lungs. So there is the parietal pleura of the lung and there is the visceral pleura that is tightly adhered to the lung and there is the parietal cavity So here you can see the right and the left lung. You can see the serous membranes, the pleura. There's the parietal pleura that lines the cavity. And then there would be the visceral pleura that is adhered tightly to that lung. For the pericardium, you can see the parietal pericardium that lines the pericardial cavity. And then there is the visceral pericardium that lines and is tightly adhered to the heart.